Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Gemology for Schmucks. My name is Peter Nelson. I'm here to guide you in everything you need to know about gemstones. Now, I've got here four stones. They're basically a lilac color, and we're going to identify them together because my friend called it the Evening Stone, and that's not a mineral name. What does that even mean? So let's look at what their properties are, identify them, and then I'll talk about some of their other characteristics that can help you to know, is this a stone that you might want to collect? And how should you take care of it? Because there is a mystery in the name The Evening Stone. Spoiler alert. Moving on. So we're going to start with our free test here, the Polariscope. We've got it in crossed filters. If you don't know what that means, you should go and watch the Polariscope video first. Or you can watch this one and then watch that one. It'd suit you. We're going to take this round one first and I can see that it's clearly blinking. Now, the other good news is that as I look right at the table, from a certain angle, I can see those rainbow interference colors, which means if we use the conoscope, I should be able to see, is this a doubly refractive biaxial stone or doubly refractive uniaxial stone? We know it's doubly refractive, why? Because it's blinking. So let's check it out. Whoa. Very clear, very easy to see, and those of you who have been watching this channel should know this bow tie effect tells us very clearly, undeniably, that it is doubly refractive biaxial. That means it has more than one optic axis. Let's check another one. And there we go. Same biaxial bow tie effect. I love when I can find an optic figure. Okay, so let's move on and take our refractive index reading. Using our refractometer, we're going to take a little bit of this poisonous liquid, the refractometer liquid, <laughs> stinky, put it right on the hemicylinder, cleaning off our stone, and got about 1.66 to 1.68. Rotate it. And now we've got the two rays oscillating right over 1.67. So we're going to say 1.668 to 1.672. And really what we're looking for is the maximum birefringence range. Now I'm going to make another video specifically on the characteristics of uniaxial stones and biaxial stones so that we can dive deeper into those details. If I talk about it now, it's going to be a very, very long video. So if you haven't subscribed yet, that's coming. Okay, now let's check another stone. Our refractometer liquid is still wet, so we should be able to use it again for this extra stone. Okay, same thing, 1.66 to 1.68. Rotate it. Okay, so we're looking at the same maximum birefringence range of 1.66 to 1.68, approximately. If we wanted to go through and get very specific on those numbers, then we could get more specific on that birefringence range. So let's go to our chart and see what is in that realm. So in the approximately 1.66 to 1.68 range, we're only going to look at doubly refractive stones. We're going to cut everything else out. So that leaves us with silimonite, fibrolite, spodamine, and coneropine. And each of these three also has a very similar birefringence range, somewhere in the range of 0 0.0135 all the way up to 0 0.02. Now, if, again, if we were more rigorous with our refractive index testing, we might be able to narrow down and cross off some of these. But really, they are so close. Unless you are able to trust your eyes 100%, it's best to just keep each of these three in there and try and use other characteristics to rule out the other possible suspects. So the other characteristics that I know these stones have are that some of them are biaxial positive and some of them are biaxial negative. And we're going to go into that in the other video. What else can we rely on? Specific gravity? Let's see, we've got 3.25, 3.18, and 3.30. These are too close to distinguish in my opinion. Any error in the specific gravity testing process could confuse you and make you believe that it's one or the other stone. When the difference is that close, I don't think specific gravity is a reliable test. So what else do we have? So the two other things are common colors in that type of gemstone, and then a more rigorous test is going to be fluorescence. Spodamine has the most unique characteristic in this, in that 
Spodamine, which has a variety of this color, a stone called kunzite, same mineral, different variety name, but it has fluorescence. So if we look at this under UV, long wave UV, spodamine oftentimes fluoresces quite strongly. So let's see if we can get away with that. And lucky for us, it fluoresces in that same spodamine color, that chalky orange. Now, if I was being totally rigorous as a gemologist, I would go through those extra steps of checking to see whether it's negative or positive biaxial. And I might look for some other distinguishing features, but because I have a strong idea of what this stone was, we can go ahead and cut to the chase. So if you were dealing with spodamine, long wave UV can be a very useful tool, just to verify, because it typically fluoresces. This particular RI range has many different difficult to sort out stones, but spodamine, which is a common stone to be found in the trade, has this unique feature. So there again, our three-way torch is an important part of our EDC everyday carry. Quick draw, moving on. So let's talk about the properties of spodamine. Spodamine is a mineral name, and it has several different varieties that you will hear in the trade from time to time. By far the most common is going to be kunzite. You can find that in many places in Bangkok, and it comes from many different origins, but a lot of it is from Afghanistan and Pakistan. The range of colors for kunzite tends to be in this lilac to purple range. Because it is a biaxial stone, it has the potential for pleochroism. So as we rotate the stone 90 degrees, we might find a different color because of the optical characteristics. These particular pieces don't seem to have pleochroism, but I have seen pieces of kunzite where it will be purple in one direction and green or blue in another direction. Trichroism only happens with biaxial stones, because biaxial has those extra two optic axes. So while kunzite is the most common, it's certainly not the only spodamine out there. There's a green variety of spodamine called hiddenite, as well as a yellow variety called triphane. And perhaps there's other colors out there, but these are the most common trade names. And those are just varieties of the mineral spodamine. Kind of like when we say corundum, and it can mean ruby and sapphire. All spodamine is going to be doubly refractive, biaxial, and inside of this approximate RI range, having that maximum birefringence range of 0.014 to 0.02, the RI being 1.66 approximately to 1.68, and there's always some variation inside of nature, but it's going to have these two characteristics more or less close to each other, plus or minus a little bit. Now there's two properties about kunzite and allspodamine that we need to keep in mind. The first one applies to allspodamine, which is its perfect cleavage. It has two directions of perfect cleavage, which is why the notes say that it can have a triangular or sail-shaped fracture. Two directions of perfect cleavage, and then perhaps another direction of weakness. So if the crystal is breaking in those two planes, and then the other one is just a point of weakness, then it just snaps off on its own, creating a triangle. If you look at areas on a stone that have high wear, or if you get to see the natural crystal before it's been cut, you can see those triangular shapes in many different places. We mentioned fluorescence. That's an important part of identifying spodamine. Most pieces that I have seen, I hesitate to say all just because I hesitate. It's one of my characteristics. But all in my memory have had fluorescence under long wave UV, which is what we've got in this torch. Oftentimes it's that chalky orangish color. So if you're out in the field, you're gonna to need to check in a dark space. If you've got all this extra light, it's not going to be easy to see. Now, one thing that is unique to kunzite as opposed to the other varieties of spodamine is that it is light sensitive. It has this beautiful lilac color, but it is UV sensitive, which means that if you're wearing it out in the daytime under the sunshine, the color will fade. So it may be an intense color when you get it, but if you're wearing it out for your luncheon, eating your avocado toasts, then over time you will see that the color fades. Strong lights, like in a display case, for those of you that are jewelers, can also cause the color to fade. So it's very important when you're taking care of quinzite to keep it in a dark place. If you have a jewelry box or something like that, close the lid. Now you hear that it's color sensitive, so some of you are probably thinking, well, what's the point of having it at all if the color's going to fade? And remember, we said during the day, avocado toast, strong lights. So if you're wearing it at night or in the evening, perhaps going to the opera, then the color will remain fine. So that's one of the characteristics that we have to keep in mind. I'd also like to make a point on the cleavage aspect because people think, doesn't that mean it's a weak stone? And this is where we need to go back to the conversation about hardness as opposed to toughness. The stone is actually decently hard. It's about the same as tourmaline or jade. 6.5 to seven, pretty good. So it will resist scratching pretty well. 
but because of its cleavage characteristics, I wouldn't necessarily suggest it as a ring, because if you're knocking it on things, the chances that it will shear or chip off certain areas are much higher. It's much more brittle. It is not a tough stone. But whether we're talking about quinzite or any of the other varieties of spodamine, one of the advantages of spodamine is that it does have bright luster and decent fire. So as a crystal, it looks quite nice, and it's plentiful enough that the price point is really attractive. So if you were making an affordable line of jewelry, you wanted some big stones for a good price, quinzite's a pretty good choice, or spodamine in general, if you wanted a different color. You just need to keep in mind those characteristics. And one other point for those of you that are jewelers thinking about making a line, it's important to work directly with a dealer that specializes in quinzite, in my opinion, because if you wanted to recut these stones, there are specialist cutters that are willing to do this. Many other general cutters hate to cut quinzite because of that cleavage. It makes it very difficult to both cut and polish and retain more of the crystal. The ones that have experience doing it are perhaps a bit more bold, but I would certainly, on my own, not be interested in buying stones and cutting with a separate cutter. It would be a big headache. But if you are working with a dealer that knows they have their own cutters, and you wanted certain shapes, and you wanted to buy parcels, then you could say, okay, I want X number of pieces in these shapes, can you get them for me? And they'll say yes or no. Then you can negotiate the price. So as with everything, there's a value and a purpose to everything, and it is a beautiful stone. We just need to decide what are we getting for what price? So there you go. If you're interested in contacting me directly, head over to gemshepherd.com where you can get on my mailing list. The rest of you hit like, hit subscribe, tell all of your friends about me, and until next time, bye-bye.